the start of King Aegon V Targaryen, known as Aegon the Unlikely's reign, was always going to be challenging for a man who never expected to be king, or had the years of training and preparation most princes of House Targaryen had, spending years as heir to prepare for the day that they became king. But even so, there were examples of men who never expected to become king, such as the likes of Jaehaerys the Conciliator, whom went on to become perhaps the best king Westeros ever saw. Thus, despite the uncertainty surrounding King Aegon's ascension to the Iron Throne, there was no telling what kind of king he would become in time. The issue surrounding the murder of Aenys Blackfyre at the Great Council was a tricky political challenge to navigate, with the influence and power Bloodraven, Brendan Rivers had a court. His decree to send Rivers to join the Night's Watch showed many what kind of king Aegon would evolve into one day. The arrest and punishment of Bloodraven, who many still believed practiced the dark arts, was a bold and unexpected move, one that many advisers of the king surely would have advised against. But Aegon used this moment as a way to stamp his own authority over the lords of the Great Council, who doubted his credentials as king though there were still those who questioned Aegon's choice to punish Bloodraven, as, after all, wasn't House Blackfire the enemy of the Iron Throne, who had brought war and death to the fields of Westeros time and time again? What is the honour of a king compared to a realm at peace from the Blackfire threat? But that was to be only the first of the challenges King Aegon V would have to deal with in the first few months and years of his reign. When the Great Council convened in 233 AC, they did so in the midst of perhaps one of the worst winters in generations. A winter that had lasted three years and showed no signs of abating, and in truth was worsening by the week. There was mass starvation and suffering in the north, as there had been a hundred years prior, in the long winter that reigned from 130 to 135 AC, during the Dance of the Dragons and the troubled start of the Regency period, even passing the Neck into the Vale, Riverlands and Westlands. Food was starting to run scarce, and the small folk, like the people of the north, were potentially facing the prospect of starvation if spring did not come soon. As has been well documented, King Aegon had spent his youth as a squire of a hedge knight, so Duncan the Tall, spending countless years wandering the Seven Kingdoms from the Sands of Dawn to the Frozen North, not in a gilded carriage, but in a saddle, camping under the stars, occasionally in a stable of an inn, or the holdfast of a landed knight or of a lord, Aegon and Sir Duncan were in service of. While some of the adventures of Sir Duncan the Tall and King Aegon V are well documented, such as the tawny Ashard Meadow, the checky water dispute between House Osgrey and Weber in the Reach, and the infamous wedding tawny white walls that turned into the Second Black Fire Rebellion, there are many adventures that only Aegon and Sir Duncan could speak of, with no documented record of them. This unconventional upbringing gave King Aegon V a view of the small folk of Westeros that no Targaryen king had ever had before. While some question King Makar's choice to allow his son this path in life, it must be recalled that Makar himself, let alone Egon, was far down the line of succession at this point in time. With the personal issues of two of Egon's elder brothers, Daron and Arion, perhaps this different approach Makar took with Egon was needed to ensure he grew into a more well-balanced man than his troubled brothers. If that was truly Makar's intent, an argument can be made that it did have the desired effect, as Egon was a very different man from his brothers, and unlike any king that had come before him or to come after him. King Egon, even before he came to the throne, was always concerned for the welfare of the poor and the weak, given his experience with them during his childhood. Thus, in this harsh and never-ending winter, Egon did what little he could to increase the flow of grain and other foods to the north, where it was most badly needed. But therein lies the heart of the issue. As while Egon's actions were good intentioned, some would argue that they were naive in some respects, with some lords and advisers at court feeling he did too much in this regard, with countless lords wanting to hold on to their own stores of food, as in truth they had no clue how much longer this winter would last. While many of course did have sympathies with the suffering in the north, and sent what little food they were able, they believed that the sending of food would only cause starvation among their own people, who they had responsibility for, if the winter did not relent soon. As for now, spring was but a dream. There was also a small but vocal number of lords, 
who were still not convinced of Egon's credentials to be king. Despite the clear majority voting for him at the Great Council of 233 AC and would use any act they saw as questionable or divisive to prove the idea of Egon's lack of political ability and understanding of kingship. But at the end of the day, despite the grumblings of a few, the king's will was the king's will and the food was sent north. How much of an impact it truly had on the suffering in the north or the impact to the people to the south, we can never know. Egon's rule was also quickly tested by those whose affairs he had meddled in too often as a prince. Attempting to reduce their rights and privileges was always going to be a prickly issue. An issue that has always been hard to successfully tackle. Even the great King Jaehaerys the Conciliator had difficulties with similar matters with good Queen Alassane's reforms to the succession laws, with the likes of the Widow's Law and the outlawing of the right to the first knight, with a particular resistance in the north. Lords never liked to lose power and privileges they already had, and making these changes is always an uphill battle and can take generations to properly enforce. Even by the time of the Baratheon era of Westeros, there are still some places and a few houses who still found ways to keep their old customs. Nor had the Blackfire threat ended with the death of Aenys Blackfire at the Great Council of 233 had only heartened the enmity of the exiles across the Narrow Sea. Even Egon's punishment of rivers did little to dampen the enmity between the Black Dragon and the Red, as perhaps the king had hoped. In the year 236 AC, as the bitter and cruel six year long winter finally drew to a close and the snows started to thaw and the winds lost their bitter edge, House Blackfire raised its head once more to try and overthrow House Targaryen. The fourth Blackfire rebellion saw the self-styled King Daemon III Blackfire, son of Hagon Blackfire and grandson of Daemon I Blackfire, crossed the narrow sea with bitter still, Aegor Rivers and the Golden Company at his back, and Blackfire, the sword of kings in hand. Mm -hmm.